it's um really good to see many people here who are getting younger. I'm a little bit self-conscious because I think um, there are other people watching us, right? Through the Zoom, right? <laughs> so we better behave. I didn't know that I'd been here eight times. <laughs> anyway, um, I consider myself as um, a Vajrayana practitioner. And a um, lot of that has to do with um, culture, maybe, uh, because I was um, born and, yeah, I was born and groomed by <clears throat> culture or country or a culture or a family that has a Vajrayana it is a Vajrayana phenomena um, that may be a good thing in one way. Some people will consider this as a fortunate thing. Mm, but uh, it could also be it, it could also be a veil, some sort of a obstruction in the real path. Sometimes I look at, uh, I think of this. Um, I grow up looking at, you know, uh, pictures and statues of all kind very serene, um, saintly looking Shakyamuni Buddha. And um, wrathful, skull garland. Um, deities, female and male deities in union. Mm, images of uh, figures that has buffalo head, elephant head. Um, many, many times all together, those devilish looking figures and holy looking um, And um, no question is raised in my head. And I don't know whether it's a good thing or a 
not a good thing from the actual Vajrayana point of view. Sometimes I think it's good, other times I feel that maybe all this may have um, distanced myself from actually appreciating the tantric wisdom that the culture ended up hijacking me. Um, but I also grow up in a culture and a tradition that um, if, that cherishes reasoning and that actually quite vigorously I would say at least 10 to 15 years of my um, time was spent studying Buddhist logic Mm, critical thinking, analytical thinking. Where you analyze so much, so much so that you deconstruct everything, including the Buddha and the Dharma, the Sangha, everything that we venerate. Um, just as how Buddha himself uh, advise us to do so. He 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 to, he told he encouraged us to analyze, never to take things at face value. And I have to say, this I have done. Um, and. Um, also, in the la as, as I grow up, I have discovered that this kind of appreciation of reasoning and logic and analytical thinking is not only within the Indian or uh, Tibetan tradition, but very much so in the West. So, I grow up really getting excited and really appreciating um, what do you call it? Renaissance? Renaissance or age of reasoning? Romantics? Is it romantics? Age of reasoning? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> um, but um, I also, you know, I guess you can say, uh, from a Dharma point of view, from the Bajrayana point of view, you know, I would go to, during the summertime, I would go to Buddhist college to deconstruct everything, basically. Analyze everything. And then, during the winter break, when I was growing up, there was you know, or my family people. And usually, you know, my family from both sides, they're um, yogis, Mahamudra and Mahasandhi sort of lineage. And um, yeah, a lot of insinuation from both sides that how much I'm wasting my time analyzing things, deconstructing things, how I'm wasting my life doubting everything, how I am so deprived with things like pure perception, devotion, you know. Uh, looking back, I think it's very fortunate that I have that. But, you know, growing up, it was so, so much confusion. Winter, there's all that 
calling the Guru, the Telopa, the Naropa, the you know, Longchenpa, Guru Rinpoche, Yeshe Tsogyo, all this mind-boggling stuff when Guru Rinpoche went to Tibet, the mountains even, you know, bowed down and the things moved and then there were all those miracles and and during the summertime there were all these campos like deconstructing everything. <coughs> but anyway, um, after now 50 years going this and that, I, I think I can say um, I have I don't know, I have an appreciation, a veneration. I, I don't want to, I think it is too arrogant for me to claim that I practice Vajrayana. That is too arrogant. But um, I think I can sort of say that, uh, that I, I aspire, I wish, I practice Buddha Dharma in general and especially Vajrayana. Not all the time, by the way. Time to time, when I'm sober, so to speak. Because, <clears throat> you know, um, I, you know, I really get um, very thrilled and very excited and convinced. I like the ideas like poison is medicine. You know, I, I, like, I just like that. It, you know, it excites me. <laughs> I like when I hear things like, um, you know, profane is sacred, you know, tampa, sacred, sacred, right? And I like things like, when I hear things like um, that this, this emotion that I have, this emotion very is wisdom. I like that. Yeah, of course, just intellectual level, but I mean, this is the year 2021. Having this kind of statement alive, that's, that's good. You know, that's amazing. And um, not only these are just a statement, poison is medicine, emotion is wisdom, profane is sacred. Not only these are just a statement, Oh, by the way, um, if the translators are having a hard time, I can slow down a little bit. So if someone can send a message. <coughs> um, not only there's that kind of statement, that kind of philosophy or a science, if you like. But there's actual technique, there's actual path that is there that you can actually apply these technique. Um, you know, what do you call it? Empiri empiricism, right? Empiri empiricism. You know, we like to have that, isn't it? Empirical. And that's very much so with this, this, um, this wisdom of profane is sacred and poison is medicine and so on and so forth. This is something that is empirical. This is something that you can actually experience. Um, 
you can actually <clears throat> you can actually find out whether you are this emotion it doesn't matter what kind of emotion it can be <clears throat> very um melancholic sentimental or it can it can be very um destructive even or very <clears throat> dull and depressing but it is possible now to experience that there are actually wisdom this is not just a statement i know it is difficult to sort of accept it but is that's just because uh, you know we are not giving this a chance and if you really give the chance it is possible it's not a myth it's not a story and um this kind of practice this kind of tradition and know-how has been there for 2000 years is not just like recently discovered somewhere in the south beach when someone got excited looking at a sunset this is very much you know tested uh by many people and um by a lot of people in fact a uh, lot of amazing people mm, you know scholars and um kings queens um some of the greatest um leaders in the world um <clears throat> genghis khan right actually this should this should this should tell us something genghis khan oh you know people if i say this people will think he wasn't really a, he, he wasn't really behaving like a buddhist has has he you know this is the question the people would ask this is an interesting question actually because somehow we have put buddhism into the basket of well behaving basket so yeah that is an interesting but maybe later we can discuss this <clears throat> there were a lot of interesting people genghis khan yeah he was yeah he was a buddhist but quite an interesting person and uh, <clears throat> uh there was um like uh, king tisong dewsen of tibet yeah of course if you ask a tibetan and especially a nyingmapas they will revere him as this great manjushri incarnate the compassionate the all omnipotent etc etc but history have also said that he was at times like a child like a child like like when he was upset with his ministers he would eat his shoes and he would roll on the ground and he would beat himself up but this is also a king who really ruled big time i think it's important that we <clears throat> sometimes go beyond what do you call it Stere stereotyping ah, alexander napoleon we always have a story stereotype you know like big not moving kind of the quality of human beings but anyway <clears throat> there were many interesting practitioner 
generally Buddha Dharma and especially Vajrayana, it, it has been tested and practiced and by a lot of people. And I have to say, there were a lot of charlatans too. There were a lot of phony charlatans, people who took advantage of Mahayana, Theravada, Sharvakayana, Vajrayana, all of that. That's sort of the, what we human beings do. You know, charlatans makes our life interesting. And uh, there has been a lot of that. <laughs> there has been a lot of that. There has been a lot of... Um, yeah, uh, opportunist. And um, not just because of all these strange, controversial people, but Tantra itself is a controversial controversy. Tantra itself has always been, by the way. Some may think that this Vajrayana Buddhism is becoming a controversial thing now. No, it has always been controversial, right from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> from the time it started, actually. Obviously, someone who, our system that says poison is medicine, what do you expect? That's already asking for trouble, isn't it? Um, sac uh, no, profane is sacred. You're already starting with a controversy here. Um, so, Tantra definitely is, uh, Tantra cannot be appreciated by uh, everyone, understandably, you know. Uh, not only it cannot be appreciated by everyone, in fact, there were a lot of, uh, what do you call it, um, people who really condemned Tantra. More so in Buddhism. Within the Buddhist. And rightfully so, many times. Um, Tantra has been looked at with a suspicious, you know, with a lot of suspicion, historically. Um, so, if you are looking at the tantric history, Tantra has always been kept, I don't like the word secret, but it was not exhibited, definitely. It was, um, it was, um, um, kept, guarded very zealously and uh, carefully. Um, and uh, actually, the reason why Tantra was kept secretly uh, with a lot of determination is really out of, kind, uh, out of care and compassion from the uh, people who are stakeholder, stakeholder of Tantra in the past. Because um, 
not only that uh, we need to save the people from misusing the tantra of course that of course but i think that is a much less and uh, that is a smaller uh, what do you call it thing to worry in a way but more importantly if uh, people who are not matured people who are not ready even have a slight doubt to this incredible magical um, i don't know alchemy if you like you know even if there is a little bit of a doubt this will uh, you know distend this will distend the person f- from approaching to the tantra for well according to the buddhist language eons after eons and that is very unfortunate for them so this is why we we always hear this you know like uh, our masters always our masters like my teacher jabji tingu chinsir puche one one thing he keep on repeating to people like me is like no matter what you do try your best so that someone will not have some sort of a suspicion towards the vajrayana which will then really keep them distant distant for many 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 lifetimes i will tell you something which may be kind of uh heavy to hear this there are people who mm I don't know whether I should say this but I will say it mildly mild I will I will water down a little bit okay there are people who are so afraid to believe in reasoning then falling into the hell realm some tantric practitioners they are more worried about that they are more worried about becoming sensible than going to but going to hell we can discuss about this if you if you are sort of confused <laughs> what i'm saying but this is this is a such a this is a such a it's an important statement I, you know this is a really really important statement um so but actually this is not only in the bajrayana even in the mahayana when asked chandrakirti to whom should we give shunyata teaching he said not he he never said oh to those harvard and yale graduates this i made it up but um, what i'm saying is not to those who are so smart and so well read and so reasonable and so educated he never he, he never chose them who did he choose he said you one should teach shunyata to those people who just mentioning the name the word shunyata they have a gusbam they have tears in their eyes to these people you should teach shunyata coming from chandrakirti it's quite amazing because if you read chandrakirti he was a really a big time you know reasoning man 
you know, prasangika madhyamika, really big time. He was deconstructing everything. But at the end, when asked to whom to teach shunyata, he said this. Shunyata is reserved for those just hearing the name of shunyata, you feel goosebumps. And if you think about it, it's actually quite sen- it's, it's quite reason. I mean, understandable what this, these statements. I think to be a vessel for teachings like Shunyata, teachings such as uh, Sungjuk Union, right? Union, Sungjuk, the Union like a Mahamudra or a Mahasandhi. <coughs> Just the intelligence, intellect, you know, sort of being smart is not enough. In fact, it's not that important. What you need is, you need, I think the English word is a neck, right? Neck. You know, you have to, no, neck, um, neck, neck, neck. You have to have the neck, neck. You have to have that, I don't know, you just have to, um, you know, I was looking at this word neck and the English dictionary says, some just have special neck for getting into trouble. (laughs) What do you think? (laughs) You know, some people just have that neck, neck. Like bend, right? The other way, the bend, hang, hang. You just, is it hang? Also, some just have that neck. And this, if you ask me, this neck, if you ask me, what is that? I think the Buddhist would say it's called merit. That's the best word I can come in English I can come up with. Sanam Punya. And I'm sure you know many of you you know this, you know, like you, many of you you are very I don't know for whatever reason you are inspired by half paralyzed, half drunk at times squeaking person and you are very inspired. The other people, other people get almost, you know, other people by looking at um, uh, somebody like uh, Lady Gaga, Lady Gaga and when they look at her meat jacket, right? He, she has, she wears a meat, meat outfit. And they almost come to, come close to sort of orgasmic situation. <laughs> you know, you just have that neck. <laughs> you know, you have that neck. This, this happens. This, this happens. I think you know what I'm talking about, a neck. You know, some people have really just so good at real estate. Real estate? Yeah, the housing. Some are so good at this. They just know what to buy and when to buy. They're just so... I know one person. <laughs> um, And when you meet this kind of people, then of course, no need to keep it secret with this kind of people. If not, then I think keeping it secret is maybe not the right word, like treasure, really, really, you know, protect it. It's quite important, secrecy, treasuring it not to reveal it, you know, just uh, 
uh, openly. It's kind of important. But uh, Tibetans have been so bad with this. They are, I mean, I guess the whole Tibet, somehow, one way or another, has this Vajrayana culture, so I guess it was understandable in places like Tibet or Bhutan, but... <coughs> 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 Tibetans just <clears throat> can't keep it, keep things secret. They just itching to talk and ex exhibit, and this has put Vajrayana into grave danger, especially now. You know, in pre nineteen fifty nine Tibet, <clears throat> there was no bookshop. You know where. You can also choose books like um, Kabbalah, I don't know. You, you, they, there's not much choice. There's, I don't think there was a bookshop. Maybe it's only a uh, Buddhist library. No, there's just so much of this. So, It's actually quite, sometimes I really think this is the blessing of the, the Buddhas, that it's really amazing that images such as the Chakrasambara and Vajrayogini, you, you know, we have this in the Dhamma centers in places like upstate New York, where other people also, you know, come. And, wow! What do they think? They, you know, there's so much tolerance, you know, tolerance, so much. <clears throat> Maybe the Tibetan painting is so abstract, they didn't, don't really know what's going on. Maybe. But, um, Tibetans are not so good with keeping it secret. Um, and even me today, coming here, and you all know, most of you anyway, most of you all know I'm a Vajrayana student, right? You know that. That's already not good, actually. Actually, that's already mistake. And I have myself told you just now, I am a, I aspire to practice Vajrayana. I shouldn't have said this. Especially if there are new people. That's how it should be. But now this is how it is. I told you. <clears throat> this just <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> as I said, I do have aspiration to practice the practice tantra. I, I don't want to claim I'm a tantric practitioner. I'm not saying this out of humility. I'm more like. Um, not to, you know, more like a, you know, disclaimer. <clears throat> yes, I have aspiration to practice the Vajrayana. And not always, okay? Quite a lot of time. Um, I partly, I'm, I say that uh, I have aspiration to practice Vajrayana 
but not always and not 100%. And the reason is, even after all these years, the tantric teachings still surprises me. So which means that there's a still a lot of things that I haven't, I still, you know, yet, you know, uh, yet to discover. Even as recent as, you know, in New York. When I was in New York, somebody gave me a volume of a, a tantric text. And uh, just that afternoon, since there was nothing much going on, I was reading a few pages. And this text I have read so many times in the past. But it's just so surprising. There were sentences and phrases that I have read so much, but I'm finding out some new information. So, yes, I do have aspiration, but I think it can really go much more, I still think. This is because tantric view is vast and deep. And not only that, sometimes tantric view is too simple. It's so simple that just cannot, uh, what do you call it, cannot accept, dare not accept. Because habit of this logic, no pain, no gain, is so strong in my head. Just unbelievable when someone says, no pain, all gain. That's just not possible. Um, and not only the view, the technique and the skillful means, it's just infinite. Dare not accept, unfathomable, cannot fit in my small mind. There are many reasons why, we, why I dare not accept Tantra. Because no matter how I try, the theistic, theistic, right? You know, theistic residual with me is still. This is actually quite shocking, you know? Because you know, I grew up studying Madhyamika and Brahmana and so on and so forth, but must be some past life's thing. The theistic sort of a, you know, savior, you know, relying on a savior, somebody will fix me. That residual is so strong with me, so tantra becomes unfathomable sometimes. And not only that, sometimes atheist residual is also there. That atheist residual is also blocking me to understand and appreciate Tantra. It's very complicated. And, um, and recently, of course, the temptation to join the, what do you call it, bandwagon? Right, bandwagon. Wow, that is strong. Temptation to join the bandwagon. Not a tantric thing to do. You know, 
What's the expression? If you are not with us, you are with enemy, right? Well, you, oh yeah. If you are not with us, you are against us. Wow. That is strong. It really it shakes me. And when when that shakes you, then it it makes you it makes you a tantric capacity shaken. And then of course I'm so I'm also scared of the wrath of goody goody liberals. <laughs> this I have to say. <laughs> Those who are reading my Facebook or whatever, this is sort of what do you call it? My ex you know, I, I I I try to upset them upset the liberals, but this is actually what do you call it in the psychology? What do you call it? Reverse psychology or something? It just means that I'm so afraid of them. I'm trying to, I don't know. It is very scary. R the liberal wrath. Really scary. And among other things, I'm talking about how I find myself not not a healthy not i mean not strong tantric vessel um i love you know like i love collecting like pencils you know pencil i love collecting <laughs> i don't know bags yeah bags but those that doesn't matter pencil bag doesn't matter so much worse is I love collecting antidotes. <laughs> antidotes. Not good. <laughs> Tantric people don't like this. My, f my forefathers, Telopas, Naropas, I don't know what they are thinking looking down at me. I love collecting antidotes. I l and I, I think antidotes are chok, spring, what do you call it? Nyembo chok and spring. They are, they are good. I consider them as good. And then also, um, yeah, morality, ethic, considering them as wholesome. But these are all human, you know, this is how human mind works. You know, this is how human mind functions. You know, human mind is complicated. We say we like to think out of box, out of box. Not just we say we like to think out of box, but we like to also do things out of box, I guess. But to actually apply that is difficult because we also want to fit, fit with other people. I told you, you know, Joining the bandwagon, so important. Even if you are, if you are craving for a cup of nice coffee, if there is some strange, you know, coffee shop, it's difficult to choose that, isn't it? It's much safer to choose Starbucks because you already know what is there. Latte, grand, small, this. You basically know, so you feel safe. 
this the adventure, full adventure to choose this um, obscure coffee shop. It's difficult. So all this basically is um, destroy is maybe not the right word, but all this is uh, weakening at least the magic. Um, the in the Guhya Garva Tantra, the word is Jumtul Tawa, sort of a magical net. Is it magical net? It, you know, we lose this. What to do? Um, you know, poison is medicine. That is a magic. Medicine is also poison. That is also a magic. And um, fact that there is no such thing as ultimate uh, poison and ultimate medicine, that is also uh, a magic. And um, I think this then, I don't know, weakens this kind of, uh, what do you call it? Um, net of, net of maya, illusion, magic, paradoxy, which is something that is always here, always there, but uh, falling into the trap of poison, as a poison, only. Medicine is medicine only, then deprive us from actually being able to enjoy the wealth, the infinite, vast, deep wealth of this uh, magic. Anyway, probably magic is already not an acceptable uh, term in this world of what do you call it? Empiricism, science, technology. Anyway, um, Karmic connection. Power of cause and condition. Power of karmic link is so strong that um, even what do you call it? Um, 
miles and miles away from uh, Ganges in Varanasi, or in this case, I think probably it's uh, um, anyway, it doesn't matter. It, miles away from Ganges. The teachings of the Mahamudra, Mahasandhi, coming to this land. And um, brought here by Chajam Trungpa Rinpoche. And a lot of you here are uh, his um, children. Vajra student. And um, yes, I have a very mixed feeling towards this place. This is, uh, I don't know whether it's improving, <laughs> but. Um, um, so much, uh, what do you call it, um, not even thinking about Buddha Dharma in general. Um, there's a, so much appreciation and um, in awe of um, what Trungpa Rinpoche have uh, brought here. If you are looking at, I was looking at uh, some of the texts that um, Do you do this Tabokaju um, lineage chant sometimes? Mm. I don't know, for many of you, what you think, but um, even the verses like, awareness is the body of meditation, as is taught. Whatever arises is fresh. The essence of realization to this meditator who rests simply without altering. Just this message, I'm out of this verses, this this stanza. Just this stanza having brought here and um, build a systematic system, uh, I don't know, atmosphere, culture, if you like, to really bring this. You know this uh, this spirit. Spirit is maybe not the right word. This this uh, this wisdom 
it's I don't know if you if you can if one can think about these things. It's like um, mind-boggling that uh, such a teaching is brought here. And um, not just read over a coffee, talked about it, but actually, you know, a lot of you for years spent time cultivating, engaging with this kind of. Uh, Wisdom, and um, concepts such as Vajrayogini, Chakra Sampara, must be so alien. the symbol, language, the whole method. But um, this is um, still um, being carried on. And um, as somebody who is sort of, you know, um, outside, observing, past maybe 35 years now, and a uh, lot of challenge you have gone through, but still going on. Things like um, Tamal Jishepa, the word Tamal Jishepa, that is still alive. And um, there are still people who think that Tamalji Sheba pointing out are uh, important, something to sort after, something to you know invest your time and energy. These are blessings from my point of view. And I don't know, I feel very encouraged. You have to remember, it took more than a thousand years to really establish Buddha Dharma in Tibet. Here, how many years? 200 years? 200, maybe? And a um, lot of challenges, of course, because uh, this is precious. The other text I was reading, it's just incredible. Like, uh, The concept of Rigden I don't know what people who are new to this think about. Rigden is just, I don't know, it's inexpressible, but, but profound, sub, sal is what? How do you translate sal? 
a subtle, clear, brilliant, mm, what profound, brilliant, just, and firm, powerful, powerful. To this one, you know, tetsum mebara chasalo. Not, you know, never to have any doubt towards this. I was talking to some young people today. I feel very encouraged, and this I want to repeat. Um, I was, you know, I heard that the world of artificial intelligence is coming up more and more. So people are going to have identity crisis because of that. Because, you know, a lot of jobs and professions are going to be taken over by artificial intelligence, which means that who are we? Are we? What are we now? What is you know? Because many times we identify ourselves with a job, I guess, or some sort of profession. And then, of course, in the modern day, we alienate ourselves. We have an existential existential angst. It is at that time. If you can just continue a little bit, just a few more years, I would say, 100 years, I would say, yeah. <laughs> if you can just continue, hold these values of Rigden, Sap, Sal, Song, Zen, and then there are subsequent stories about how You know, some people are scared of this, you know, rigden, whatever, you understand? You feel sort of scared or doubtful, and then all these cowardly people will arise, something like that. I don't know how you translate it. I'm just reading the Tibetan. And then, then all sorts of bunch of coward people will arise, and then what do they do? <laughs> they go and hide in the cave. In the forest. And in the water, I think. And then they kill their own kins and eat their flesh. This is a letter of Ashe, is it? Letter of Black Ashe. I'm just reading in Tibetan. Really badly I'm translating, so <laughs> don't laugh at me too much. But it's just incredible. If you can just hold on to this just another hundred years. This is iPhone 12. So when this is in Metropolitan Museum in about 20 years, and when people laugh at this, you know, what a funky, you know, clunky thing that they use. At that time, these words will be the answer to this identity crisis. I, I need you to say this. Tonight, this is, this is actually the only thing I wanted to say. The, all the other things that I've said earlier, just to fill up the sort of the evening. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I wanted to say for those who are here. Of course, you will have challenge, of course then, you know, you have to, you know, deal with it and, you know, sometimes be 
strong, sometimes be very skillful and glide through this. But this needs to be treasured. And I think a lot of people here are doing incredible uh, work preserving this. I offer my rejoice. I know some people are not having enough, even enough time to do some other things, but, right? Anyway, I won't go through the detail. Okay, so, I was told there's a lot of questions. I don't know whether we have enough time to answer all, but uh, maybe some questions. Hello? It's on now. Okay. <coughs> I will, yeah. Can't take the mask off. <laughs> Rinpoche, these questions have been submitted from people all over, and uh, we selected a few to start with. These are the difficult questions. <laughs> oh. How can you actually tell if a teacher is being abusive, acting out of confusion, or is acting with skillful means? How can you tell? Mm. This question, I don't know where is this question, come, who is asking this question? If, because this kind of question should not even be there if you are not studying and practicing Tantra, Vajrayana. Um, of course, even in the Vajrayana, um, the teacher actually is more responsible in taking care of the student as his or her only child. So, abusing and harming the student in the Vajrayana is fundamentally wrong because the Vajrayana is basically based on Prati Moksha, which is, uh, you know, um, you know, no matter what, what kind of tantric practitioner you are, you have to practice, you have to take refuge to Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha. And as someone who has taken refuge to Buddha, Dharma and the Sangha, the fundamental practice is not to harm others. So even on that level, um, teacher is not supposed to, what do you call it, harm others. But having said that, in the Tantra, now, if you are consciously, and this has been uh, something I have been saying in, because of all the recent uh, happenings within the Vajrayana world. Uh, I've been saying this. In the, if you have consciously decided to apply the Vajrayana with, after a lot of analysis, after a lot of thinking, after deciding that this is the path that you are going to take, this is an adventure that you will take, join, then you have to have the wits and guts and the courage to take a lot of things as a, not just skillful means, but as a wisdom. 
But as I said earlier, if this uh, question is coming for generally all Buddhism, no. In the Sharvakayana, in the Theravada, and in the Mahayana, no. This um, um, this is, uh, I mean, it's it's much more clearer, much more black and white in the causal path. Yes, in the Vajrayana path, it is much more uh, difficult because Vajrayana is uh, sort of, a, what do you call it? Um, individual choice. You have to really choose this. Uh, but again, I have to, I'm, I've been realizing that this question is probably also based on, I don't know where is this question coming from. Um, there's a lot of, uh, what do you call it, um, background of this question. Um, okay, this may sound not so good for a lot of people, but um, I think we need to say this. Um, Buddhism is never really, really, its ultimate aim is not really to develop a social structure, you know? Yeah, it's never really that. And I'm saying this uh, in reference to many other religions. I think many other religion is connected to, uh, you know, social structure, morality, ethic, etc., etc. Buddhism is not really that, and this will always emotionally or intellectually, I think it ends up conflicting people a little bit. So this is where, this is why I always encourage people should really um, sort of have, go through a, some sort of an in-depth study. I mean, one good example, I'm always telling this, like there's no such thing as a Buddhist wedding. You know, it's a social structure. Maybe many religion have this. Or many religion even have things like, if you steal somebody's wallet, what to do with their hand? But, you know, Buddhists don't really have that. Let's say there is actually a Buddhist wedding. More likely, Buddhists would also have a divorce ceremony. You know, this is how the Buddhists think. It's not really so... This question is very, very vast, really vast. So if, you, if this question is coming from some sort of a structure, yeah, kind of a social structure, then it gets really complicated. But yes, fundamentally, this is what I need to tell you. If you are a Buddhist, you are, um, you have taken refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Asanga, therefore you cannot harm others. That is fundamental. But harming, not harming, helping, not helping, all this also gets so complicated because it's very subjective. And also, mm, you know, like good and bad. So subjective. I'm sorry, I'm not really answering this, um, but clearly, but I can't really clearly explain this mm, for a general, uh, uh, more than what I just said, you know, if, since, you are a, since you are a Vajrayana, if you are a Vajrayana guru, then this, this must mean that you are practicing Mahayana and the Sharvakayana, I mean, the Sharvakayana, therefore, no, you cannot harm others, definitely not. 
in with the intention and action no cannot okay next question okay <clears throat> If Vajrayana is so great, why are so many longtime Vajrayana practitioners still totally confused and disconnected from reality? <laughs> Yeah. But that, I think, is easier, I think. <laughs> well, I don't know, you know? Um, just because you are a Vajrayana, Vajrayana practitioner doesn't mean that you are really practicing it properly. That's the one. Number two, maybe he or she is really trying to disconnect from the society. And that could be, that could be pain in the neck for a lot of people. It's very subjective also, again. Um, I think, yeah, it's very, very subjective. Maybe you see them as confused and, what was it, dysfunctional? Disconnected from reality. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm sure you, you may think like that, but that's really difficult, isn't it? I mean, okay, uh, what did Jing Melingpa said? Mm. You know, if you're looking at the prayers written by the great masters of the past, it's, it, there's a lot of that, you know, like the way they define a perfect human. Uh, according to Jingme Lingpa, if you are disconnected from a reality, reality in the, you know, human's reality, you have achieved your goal. <laughs> you know, you have done a good job. He has this kind of prayers. May, what did he say? May hundred things that I wish never come true. May hundred things that I, may thousand things that I dare not wish comes true, stuff like that. So, that is maybe, that's again a little difficult to answer. I do not, I don't want to say that. Yeah, I'm sure there must be a lot of disconnected to reality, Vajrayana practitioner. I mean, myself, I have to say, you know, I volunteer as a good example of very much, I'm not just saying this, very much. Um, uh, yeah, I told you already in the big, you know, the half part of what I said earlier, there's a lot of schizophrenia kind of element in me. You know, it's very difficult. But when I told my masters what to do with it, he said it is, uh, it's actually, um, it, it actually means that I'm struggling between, uh, you know, the world of dharma and world of you know material world and he says that that's probably at least uh, you know sort of a beginning stage of good thing he said at least i'm at least i'm a schizophrenia at least i'm not totally completely blindly happy with this illusory world. I think maybe it's a good thing. So it's very, very difficult. If you want to talk about poison is medicine level of conversation, you need to really think like that. I don't want to, you know, like say, 
I, can't, I don't want to put, I don't want to tell you, okay, this is the right thing to do. This is the wrong thing to do. Who am I to say this? You know, I don't have that kind of, you know, I'm not an almighty person who can decide this. Did you want to do Okay. Uh, Rinpoche, I have t two questions. The first one is I'm really wondering if you could say a little bit more about why it's so bad in the Vajrayana to collect antidotes. And the second one is if you have any advice of, for those of us that deeply in our bones want the letter of the black ashe to still be available in a hundred years, what can we do now, especially when we feel disheartened? Um, the collecting antidote business um, you need to hear this, that is bad, but you should still keep on collecting. <laughs> but you need to hear it. This is the thing about tantric path, I'm telling you. It tells you to do something, it says something and it makes you, uh, it, it, it also makes you do something else. You know, like in the sadhana practice, the whole morning, it makes you rise as a deity, and suddenly, within one second, you have to dissolve everything. Stuff like that. As for the keeping the... Why is it bad? Hmm? Why? We need to hear it's bad, but why is it bad? Because if you have an antidote, then you will always have the opposite of antidote, and which you don't want, right? Why, why would, yeah, so which means you have a problem, so get rid of both. Uh, as for the, um, you know, like the wealth of, you know, like black ashe, the words, all of this, um, as I said, I think you guys are doing it right now. I think you just need to continue, continue whatever you are doing. Uh, probably sometimes we get disheartened because we tend to think that an organization or a board of people who, would, who should do this and that, when they don't do it, then we get disheartened. But if you're looking at the history of Buddha Dharma, it's always it's always out of nowhere somebody will come and protect. It's always like that. Look at the history of, of the Buddha Dharma. I mean like, wow, the mother of uh, Asanga and um, Vasubandhu, you know, India, male domineering, male chauvinist society, you know, like men, 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 all of that. And then there's this nun, this is, I think we are talking about what, Asanga, 6th century? Even before, right? I think so, before, because six, yeah, 4th century, nun, Buddhist nun, you know, she was so disheartened and she really wanted to protect Buddha Dharma, so she really doesn't know what to do because she's a woman, India, man, all that. So she just hadn't had an affair with a, a prince just to make a baby and then came out Asanga. Just imagine India, nun, flirting with a prince. Wow, the scandal she had to go through. And then as if this is not enough, she jilted the prince and then hang around with a Brahmin. That's like unacceptable in India. And then came Vasubandhu, who was this to Asanga and the Vasubandhu, they are the, like a pioneer of the, you know, Mahayana one, you know, they, they're like equal to, I would say Asanga is equal to Nagarjuna. So I think from the most unexpected and can come. And I think this, exists because there are people who are motivated. I think this is so true even with the, Buddha, 
in the, in the world today, Dharma today, I have noticed this. Even in, you know, like in the West, many times Rinpoche's, like myself, I don't know, uh, stakeholders, we don't do as much as we should be doing, but then there's always this like a mother of three children, no husband, work, have to work hard, she is the one who's cleaning the center, making the photocopies, I don't know, cooking, making people come to listen to these teachings, work so hard. So these people will always hold the fort, I feel. Okay? So, any more question? Maybe, yeah, there. There are some more questions. Okay. From cyberspace. How can you continue to defend the system and the people that have ruined many people's lives? Mm. That I have think caused harm. What? That have caused harm, ruined my friends and my lives. Mm. I don't know again where's this question coming from. If the question is referring to things <laughs> I have written or said. I have always been really talking about how Vajrayana needs to be guarded and defended. Not really the person, if people sort of read it carefully, because, what, what's the English expression? Throw, don't throw baby with a bath water. Yeah, I think that is quite important. Um, so even if you are looking at like words like rigden, sap, sal, song, zen, wow, you cannot throw this. Those are important. Those are going to be beneficial for a lot of people just because certain uh, people who you have a very reasonable or unreasonable expectations and assumptions do not really perform their job or you see it that way, if you also discard this, it's a loss for, I think, all of us. And this has always been what I have been trying to say because a Vajrayana is really, really uh, precious. And um, yes, as I said, Vajrayana suffered a lot with the controversy stuff because of the, may, I think many times because of the tantric people. You know, how they behave, how they are not skillful, how they, I don't know, exude themselves. Uh, but uh, tantra wisdom itself is so precious and so timely and uh, um, especially for the modern people I think it's so good. Um, if you want to be thinking out of the box, this is it. If you disregard this, no way going out of the box. I don't think so. I have I have thought about this, you know, for months and months and months, um, especially during these past two years because of pandemic, there was a lot of time to think. So, yes, mm, the, the Vajrayana is incredible and that need to be protected, okay? Maybe one more question and then. What would you say to the children of parents who were so focused on getting enlightened that their children experienced neglect 
or, or even abuse. <clears throat> These are such a big questions. Um, parenting. I, I have never been a parent myself, so I'm not in the position to really make much comment. But um, what I have been telling my friends who have children is uh, I think it is a sensible, commonsensical thing to do is never really force and shore down the Buddhist values and ethics and, I don't know, teachings. Even practically speaking, the children always seems to do the opposite of what you say. So, maybe it is not a skillful thing to do. Instead, if you want your children to also follow, like let's say Buddha Dharma, ideally, if you as a parent keep on doing your practice with the humility, compassion, kindness, just, um, tolerance, big mind, big vision, big view, I think children will always be very proud of you, children will always look up to you and see you as, you know, as at the, you know, they say that the parents are, you are parents at the real school. So I think if the parents just keep on doing their... I'm assuming that this question is regarding the Dharma practitioner parents. So if it is, um, dharma, if you keep on doing your Dharma practice, but not really imposing on them. Mm, sometimes actually deliberately not imposing. Almost like you know, keeping them out a little bit, out of skillful means. They might want to actually come into you more. Then you pretend that, you know, you don't want them right away. Then they will want more. I think something like that probably is the way to go. But, um, uh, parenting is difficult, I think, especially in this modern age where I feel that individualism, liberal value, so much uh, cherished and hyped. And now there's all kinds of media that will help you alienate yourself from each other. So I don't know how the parents are even going to have any kind of an impact. I mean the future, future parents. Something to think about. Mm. But um, there's always going to be a conflict, I think, between wanting to be, wanting to fit in. I'm sure all the uh, future generations, they will always want to fit in. I don't know how they will want to fit in, maybe through social media or internet. Um, anyway, if the question is regarding as a Buddhist Parents, how do we set, how do we deal with, uh, how do we at least not neglect? Is by practicing the Dharma authentically, properly, 
and not imposing that to them. I think so. Okay. Thank you. May I say something? Yes. Because okay. uh, I am one of those kids, by the way. <laughs> Good evening. And um, I uh, met Trump Rinpoche when I was five. First time I met him, and this is true, I screamed. Absolute bloody murder. Uh, my mother was a very young mother. She was a single mother, 18. Um, and in some sense, and this is kind of true thinking about it, I haven't stopped screaming since. <laughs> it, this is true. It, it's a penetrating type of energy. And what I remember very clearly is it shifted my entire life. My mother met this crazy, crippled, Tibetan person and packed me and my half-brother up in a truck and drove across the country. That's crazy on so, in some point of view. However, I would not trade that for anything, absolutely anything. It's inconceivable the merit I have for some reason to be able to stand here at all. And um, I did not want to get up and speak tonight. I didn't want, didn't want to ask a question, but the last question provoked me. And what it provokes is it's very important that we cherish our mothers as children. Our mothers give birth to future Buddhas from one perspective. So my mother is, I'm very lucky, is still alive, and she's a, she just did a nine-month retreat at Gampo Abbey, and they call her Sparky, was her nickname. Uh, Desi Howard, some people know her. Um, so, Rinpoche, could we possibly perform a magic trick? Yeah? It's gonna involve a little bit of, it's gonna involve a little bit of props, but it's a true match, and I have no attainment or special powers or anything, just totally regular guy. But I do carry around this stone, and this is gonna really piss, some of the Buddhists do not get this at all. It really makes them a little insecure. They're like, what is that guy? Like Larry, he's a Jewish, very intellectual. He's like, Ethan, get rid of the damn stone. What are you doing with the stone? And I'm like, Larry, the stone's not going anywhere. It's just a stone. But I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you a magic trick. Watch this. Now, a stone, Larry, has a secret magic power. What do you think it is? It's gravity. Gravity. So, now, we are in a room of sleeping Buddhas. And Rinpoche, all we need you to do is just be the Buddha for just maybe even like a second if that's possible. I mean, we're kind of putting our faith in you to be able to handle that part of the equation here. So I'm gonna make a wish. So this stone is a completely ordinary stone in my hand. I want everybody to take a look. It's just an ordinary stone. Everybody can see it, right? It's ordinary. This stone is also a wish-fulfilling jewel. It's priceless. I'm gonna get it insured, in fact. I'm looking into talking to some lawyers about this for a million dollars. But um, so this wish fulfilling jewel, I'm making a wish right now. And this wish is going to come true. And this wish comes from my mother. My mother said, she, I was down in Annapolis Royal, and she said, Ethan, I have these peace gates that I cart around with me for doing bugaku and gagaku. And the Vijadra, she told me directly to my face, she said, Ethan, the Vijadra told John Sell to his face, the entire kingdom of Shambhala depends on doing this ridiculous dance. That's my, sorry, that's my, it's a really excruciating dance, gagaku. Have you ever heard of this, Rinpoche? It's the imperial court dance of Japan. And what I realized when I was just up in Cape Breton is, my mother is actually a kind of lineage holder, and it's important. And that lineage comes from Togi Sensei. And the Vijayadara said, you have to do this dance because the entire kingdom of 
Shambhala depends on this. Now, he said lots of stuff to lots of people. He probably told Larry, like, translation is the most important thing in the universe. Every text you do has to be translated perfectly. I understand that. But what I'm doing is I'm creating a wish that in 2023, on September 21st, in Collapa Valley, and I'm going to sponsor, I'm going to put in $5,000 to pay my mother to take those gates and the beautiful costume and dance, Gagaku, with a live orchestra. And there are a few people who know how to play these really far out instruments. And then what I'm going to ask is all of the other Shambhala artists, like who do these flower arranging, and even the grumpy ones like Gina Stick, who just like, I don't know, I think I irritate her more than anybody. But, um, but she, when you hold one of her porcelain dishes, in your hands, you're holding the kingdom of Shambhala literally in your hand. And it really pisses me off because I don't understand why she seems so grouchy, but I, it's probably me. Um, so I'm making this wish. Now, I found this morning this stone I walked into an antique gallery this morning, and I can find objects with this stone. It's weird. I found a very beautiful vase. And it's a Shambhala vase. It's kind of like a blessing vase, except for this is from the Qing dynasty. It's very priceless, and I got it for a reasonable price. And I would like to auction that off to build a roof for the little hovel up there in Kalapa Valley. Our palace of Kalapa is infested with mice. And in fact, Gary Brown, the director, the director of Kalapa Valley, was up there fixing the roof and snakes, I kid you not, came out of the ceiling. Snakes out of the ceiling. So we need a new roof up there. So I'm pledging that in two years, I will, with this stone, with your help and a wish, we will build a new roof. Okay. Okay. Sorry to take your time. And also, Rimshay, you can always gong me off, as you know. I'm really, um, anyways, I appreciate all your time. And um, it is an unbelievable blessing that you are here. Um, it, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay. Um, and Larry, you're going to meet the stone in person.